We have uh, Susie, our Marine Operations Manager. You can walk up on the yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is like a parade here, right? Uh, we have uh, Captain Heiko Voles on board. And uh, if you did a tour a couple of days ago, you met him, and you'll see him again uh, tomorrow for those that didn't have a chance. Uh, we have Captain Bern Buchner. Uh, he's also been on board the ship, uh, a plank owner, since we departed uh, Germany back in April of 2012. Mira, our chief engineer, uh, he, we have two chief engineers on board the Falkor. Uh, we have Jeremy, our ETO, electrotechnical officer. Not only does he do AVIT work, but he also uh, oversees all the electrical work. Leighton Rowley, mar marine technician. We have Adriana, she's one of our purses on board, so uh, she takes care of all the, uh, the nice amenities and makes sure that uh, the, the food is wonderful and that, uh, that the science party that comes on board is well acclimated. Uh, so we appreciate all her hard work, her administrative work, our chief officer, uh, uh, Philip. Uh, Philip is in, uh, new with us after a, a few months, actually last July, I think that was your first cruise, right? May. May. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, but, but he comes with an extensive background working with the German research fleet. Thank you. <laughs> Pete Zur. Morning, everyone. Deputy Director of Marine Engineering. And we have uh, Paul, or Jimbo. Uh, Paul is instrumental, uh, literally instrumental, uh, as one of our lead marine technicians on board the ship. Thank you. And we have uh, Colleen, Colleen Peters. Uh, she comes to us, uh, very nice, uh, from survey, uh, working with NOAA, as a matter of fact, and, uh, She's one of our uh, multi-beam mapping experts. Thank you, Colleen. And we have uh, Nathan Cunningham. Nathan is also a marine technician, but oversees uh, the marine technician group and also the, uh, the data management. So thank you very much, uh, our team here. But I'm just, I'm just a background guy. I want to give it to, uh, to Heiko Vols. Maybe you say a, a couple of words, putting you on the spot. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, we as a FICO crew are very proud to be here. So, it's not, of course, not the whole crew. Some need to remain on board to uh, keep watch for the ship as well. Uh, but uh, we are here to represent the crew, and we are very proud of our ship. Some of uh, you have seen it already. The others may have the chance uh, tomorrow. And, uh, yeah, tomorrow we can tell you a little bit more about our mission and uh, how, uh, about the way how we are handling it. Maybe a little bit different than other research vessels are doing it. Uh, one of our ideas is uh, to lead by example, to uh, think outside of the box, do things a little bit differently, and uh, yeah, hopefully others will follow us. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy the day. Thank you very much, our Marine, marine crew, Marine Operations crew, captains, uh, Eric, thank you so much. Now we're almost ready to start our discussion panel program for the second day. Yesterday I had a invariably insightful and very interesting conversation with one of my good friends and uh, collaborators from Gordon Betty Moore Foundation, Ajit Subramanian, who is uh, here in the audience. And what he mentioned about the... Oh, yeah. Thank you, Ajit. Um, what he mentioned is while yesterday we had uh, panels that were mostly focused on science, technology, and operations, today we're progressing into panels that will mostly be dealing with an issue which is not even, maybe even more <laughs> difficult to manage, which is mostly sociological. Well, for the most part, this includes other aspects of oceanographic research as well. And you will notice that it's probably going to be a much more interesting, exciting topic for us to discuss. So we will be starting with the panel uh, about the uh, innovation in the structure of the organizations. Our long-term friend, collaborator, and also advisor, Dr. Hedy Weider from the ORCA, Ocean Research and Conservation Association, very kindly agreed to help us organize this panel. Hedy, uh, please bring your panel participants. And uh, we have an amazing group of panel participants for this panel this morning. We have uh, Director of uh, Ocean Sciences at National Science Foundation, Dr. Dave Conover. We have uh, Oscar Schaffel from Rutgers. We have Professor Peter Gerges from Harvard, Gene Maschin, Senior Engineer from Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and the President of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Susan Avery. Thank you so much, panelists. Edie, please take it away. The floor is yours. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, this has uh, been actually a fascinating panel to be part of. Uh, it's changed radically. I think um, we've had an experience of the difference between virtual and bricks and mortar just in 
preparing this because we had one idea when we first arrived here and then after we all met face to face, it's completely changed. So um, this is an improv improvisational group that you're gonna see here today. Um, and uh, Oscar and Jean have kindly offered to break into interpretive dance if things get um, <laughs> completely out of hand. Uh, so uh, what, what kind of evolved as we were doing this is, is I think we started out thinking that we knew what a virtual institute was. Our, um, the title for our talk or our panel is Oceanographic Research Organization Essentials, Bricks and Mortar or Virtual. And so we started out, I think, how a lot of us think about virtual as being geographically distributed. Um, and these could be geographically dispersed researchers um, that maintain close contact through like, electronic means. But, but really we decided, well, that's nothing more than actually a collaboration. Um, and then we were kind of holding um, the Schmidt Ocean Institute up as a model for what is a virtual institution um, in that it's a virtual oceanographic research. We were initially calling it an organization, but after discussion we've started calling it a facility that provides free access to a state-of-the-art research vessel, the RV Falcor, which we've just um, been hearing about, with all its onboard associated equipment and uh, technical support in exchange for a commitment to openly sharing the resulting scientific data and communicating the results to the research um, community. So uh, now we think that that's just one component of what a um, virtual institution is um, about. So we're gonna go through and have um, several people on the panel discuss what they think a virtual institution is and then how that approach um, impacts science and engineering. So if we could start with Susan, um, she's been kind of the leader on this because she's got some experience with uh, virtual institutions. Thank you, Edie. And could I have a first slide? Can I have the slides come up? That's great. Um, well, I think, I think a lot of people have different ideas of what a virtual organization is, but there actually is a base of knowledge and lessons learned and pilot projects that have really defined and formed a more for formal definitions of virtual organizations. And, you know, a lot of the definitions are, are mainly uh, for uh, businesses that have geographic or corporate, the for-profit world that have different locations that are bringing people together. But um, I think this particular set of definitions here, which has evolved a lot from NSF um, uh, pilot studies as well as other pilot studies on what a virtual organization is. And here, it's a, it's a group of individuals whose members and resources may be dispersed geographically and institutionally, got that, yet who function as a coherent unit through the use of cyber infrastructure and informatics. So what's important there is that the cyber infrastructure is important for enabling the formation of the teams of researchers, as well as in addition to forming and helping with the science that is to be done. Um, secondly, um, as we all would probably agree with, is that a virtual organization typically enables and provides shared and often um, real-time access to centralized or distributed resources, such as what we get from the FELCOR. Um, and other ships, um, as well as other uh, vehicles and platforms and sensors. There's specific tools that might be out there that are brought together, applications, data, um, and actually experimental operations, which you could see with the Falcar and the Schmidt Ocean Institute as well. So the, the key words here are there um, that often is that it's, it's a coherent unit, so it has to be managed. Um, and you have these shared resources that are going to be available to a group that will basically be tackling a, a topic. Um, now, most of these virtual organizations work best in the science realm if there is a focused goal or focused project that one is going to be working on that brings the teams and resources together to tackle that particular problem. Um, and so, so often you will see virtual organizations or that, that form around a specific, specific topic. If we can go to the next slide, this is, this is where we spent as a group a bit of time trying to put a little schematic diagram together of what are the elements of, of a virtual institute in a, in a conceptual form here. And what's clearly needed, obviously, is an, the internet hub. 
And that, that's sort of the glue, that's, the, that's the, the information, the management, the cyber infrastructure, the collaborative tools that are gonna, the groupware, so to speak, uh, the policies or provenance of what you're going to be doing. In other words, what are your publication policies? What are your co-authorship policies? How, what kind of data? Um, uh, uh, attribution is what it's going to make. There's probably a steering committee associated with the, um, with the uh, project that's going to be done. You have to have some news or some communication aspects of it. And so there has to be some sort of locus or internet hub that's going to be providing all of this to create all of the sort of management and interactive structures that one is going to um, need in order to do it. So now kind of think through this. Um, you have, say, say you have um, a particular science goal, um, you have a scientific project or a goal, you've seen something in some data and you, uh, that's, that's surprising and you need to, you really want to engage a broad group of people to, to, to look at this. So, so you can envision having an interdisciplinary science group uh, or it could be an engineering group if, it was, if the topic was a, a particular engineering study um, that would begin to pull together um, some of ideas of, of what what's going to be studied. They may be looking at what kind of data that needs to be pulled together. They may be looking at what kind of model runs that needs to be pulled together. They might be looking at what kind of teams that I, do I need in order to develop a new instrument. Um, they may have virtual workshops that, that focus on this uh, particular uh, program. Now, in order to do this particular topic, you would need the, the circle on the left there, which is basically the, the tools, the data, the observations, the modeling assets, all those assets which come from around the world, okay? And most of them would probably come via bricks and mortar organizations. Um, or ships, um, and it could be various levels of data. It might be raw data, it might be uh, data products that come out of this, and same with model. It could be raw model runs, or it could be uh, model uh, products that are derived from, uh, from model runs. And, and all of this is obviously nurtured and pulled together, again, by this internet hub in order to create a virtual observatory that is specific to the, the project that one's going to work on, or the topic that one's going to be addressed. This internet hub or this virtual institute um, also um, would basically have a, information commons. In that information commons, you might have um, an e-library, um, a library associated with the particular topic that you're looking at or the particular science that you want to do. It could also be an archive, a living archive for the virtual workshops or for uh, the results or white papers that might um, come out of this. Um, and uh, it, it forms, in a sense, sort of a, the memory of, of the interactions that one is, is uh, undergoing. And then there is um, probably a role that one can think of in terms of capacity building, uh, graduate student networks um, internationally that can be pulled together um, on this particular topic, um, and uh, capacity building in terms of e education um, in developing countries, or you can even think of it education and public education as, as well. So this is, this is kind of the, the conceptual sort of framework, and I think you can kind of see, I hope, that, that uh, a lot of this uh, in virtual organization is actually, uh, it still has a base, if you will, um, in a lot of the assets that you would find in bricks and mortar organizations. Um, and that, uh, that is uh, certainly uh, essential. So it's not a, a bricks and mortar or virtual, it really is a bricks and mortar and virtual. Um, aspects that we're looking at in order and the virtual to basically helps to enhance um, the ability to do science across disciplines, across geographically dis uh, distributed uh, bricks and mortar organizations um, with a particular scientific or engineering goal in mind. So I'm going to stop there. Okay, uh, so I think that that kind of gives us a, an overview of what we're talking about when we're talking about virtual. Um, and uh, then uh, we th I thought maybe Oscar could address um, some real-world situations that he's been involved with. He's been the, um, the co-founder and co-director of the Coastal Ocean Observatory Laboratory. He's been on the um, steering committee for OOI. Um, so I think he's got some, some real-world experiences with, with both the virtual and bricks and mortar and trying to mesh the two. So uh, first off, we are going to need the bricks and mortar institution. We're going to need the centers of excellence, and that'll be a recurrent theme. However, what I think a virtual organization or a virtual observatory does is it allows you to tie those centers of excellence across over a much larger scale. Um, I've not been in a virtual organization, but I've been part of virtual experiments. 
And what I mean by a virtual experiment is a highly distributed community coming together, all with different funding bases, all with different science needs, but coordinating all their activities through a web-based mode. So you can combine these disparate data streams to answer a larger question that none of the individual projects could do. Um, that requires the management to coordinate that group. It requires a culture of um, cooperation, which is a cultural issue I think we're still learning how to do. Um, but what it does provide is it provides a surge capacity to do a large field excursion over a very large geographic scale very quickly. Um, the two examples I've been involved with was one was an OOI cyber infrastructure test um, early on, but it represented 15 universities, two federal labs, um, and distributed equipment, and it was spun up in about four months, and that included ensemble modeling for both the atmosphere and ocean, and allowing essentially the cyber community to tie these groups across the country, where robots off the east coast of the U.S. were controlled by NASA scientists on the west coast, coordinated by modelers spread um, across the country. Um, so what I think these virtual organizations, if you have this management structure and you have these cyber tools to spin up a virtual uh, observatory, it allows a surge capacity um, to deal with events as they happen very quickly that our traditional model of going to sea on a ship through a single funding stream can't support. Um, so that's the great benefit. But it only works if you have that bricks and mortar institutions that provide the expertise that are willing to play together. Uh, culturally, the biggest issue I see um, in the short term is getting the people used to operating that way. In the long term, culturally, um, we have to change the reward structure. I'm on the promotions committee at the university I'm at, and uh, submitting a data set is still not considered equal as a high-profile publication, even if it might have a lasting impact of a generation. And um, it's a the reward structure for young professors, this is not probably what I would recommend early on if I was their faculty mentor. My hope is, is we're at the junction where this will change in the next five years. Great. And um, David is uh, director of um, ocean sciences at NSF and as part of that purview, he oversees the $400 million OOI project. Um, and uh, we were discussing the fact that NSF is, in some ways, becoming a virtual institution. And so, if you'd like to address those in issues. Well, yes, I, let me, uh, I'll first address this um, issue about NSF. Um, many of you know that we're moving to a new location very soon uh, in Alexandria. We'll be moving out of Arlington to new facilities in Alexandria, Virginia, in uh, probably by 2017. Uh, I mention that because uh, we are converting uh, almost all of the data and information that's involved with the National Science Foundation into electronic forms that will be stored in the cloud. And uh, already, we are more or less um, like uh, a virtual organization in the sense that almost all of the work we do and all the connections we have with all of you in the academic community are uh, most of the year, they are electronic. So in, our, in this new building, it's going to be configured in a way uh, quite different from the standard uh, situation in which everyone has an office with their own file cabinets. There won't be any file cabinets. There won't be a need for file cabinets, maybe a few, of course. But the kinds of, uh, and our agency has one of the highest fractions of workers who telework on a regular basis. Uh, and that will go up as well. People don't necessarily have to come into the bricks and mortar building anymore to do their work. So we are, uh, in a way, transforming ourselves into an organization that will work in a highly virtual fashion. And of course, the other piece of that is that uh, we want to maintain our connection and, in fact, enhance our connections with members of the community. Uh, and we do that by asking you to review proposals. We do that by asking you to participate in panels. And I think you're going to see more and more, and hopefully uh, better, uh, uh, techniques, uh, software, to run panel uh, meetings in a virtual uh, form. Uh, so those are some of the ways that we're um, transforming ourselves, I think, gradually into an organization that's more nimble and uh, more electronic, 
more, more interconnected um, to all of you. Um, I also want to mention that uh, we view the formation of um, collaborations that can be sustained in a virtual environment uh, as a very important part of bringing scientists together. And we have two programs at the National Science Foundation that are specifically about creating virtual organizations. One of them is called the Research Coordination Networks Program, and the other one is called uh, Science Cross Virtual Institutes, SAVI. Um, uh, SAVI is for creating international collaborations, and the whole goal there is to break down boundaries. That's one of the great things that virtual organizations can do. Bricks and mortars tend to have turf. They tend to own property. Um, uh, and, they, and people belong to those institutions, and sometimes the, 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 the barriers get built um, from between institutions or between nations. Uh, and virtual institutes are a way to make those uh, boundaries um, more leaky. Uh, more communication across those boundaries. Uh, so uh, we um, have uh, these two programs. Uh, each one of them uh, are, are in a way, they're virtual programs and they're not standalone programs. They're actually connected to the, to the programs in all the directorates. Um, for uh, research coordination networks, you can ask for up to um, $500,000 over a five year period. So about 100K a year. Uh, which we think is about what you need, uh, perhaps to uh, form the, the glue, the central hub in um, Susan's diagram, uh, and maintain all the connections to other people. Uh, and savvy is at about the same uh, level. It's around, I think, a maximum of 400,000 over uh, five years. And uh, building off of yesterday's conversation, uh, you don't need a hypothesis to get one of these awards. Because um, <laughs> uh, it's about building the collaboration. It's not about actually funding the science itself. It's about funding the group of people who want to join forces to address a goal, uh, a problem. And I can give you an idea of what some of the ones are that we've already funded. Um, we have a, a, a research coordination network that's focused on ecology of infectious diseases in the ocean. These are just the ocean marine type ones. We have one that deals with barrier island ecosystems, bringing people across uh, who, who all share interests in barrier islands. We have one that's focused on coral reef atolls, and we have one that's focused on ocean observation. So those are just some examples of some of the uh, networks um, that we've already built. Great, thanks David. I, I can un understand the desire to get rid of the filing cabinets given the first time I went to visit NSF. I was appalled to see stacks and stacks of proposals lining the hallways because they were they just didn't yeah, have the remember file. the days when you all had to submit 20 hard copies yes. of your proposal, and, and then we had to deal with all those. So we used to have offices filled with paper, and now um, I have virtually no paper in my office. Actually, if there are some there. It's all old stuff. There's nothing new that I'm actually dealing with. So um, from the engineering perspective, uh, Gene Massian has... Uh, 30 years of experience developing ocean projects, 12 of them um, with a defense contractor, and then 18 with uh, Ambari. Um, so I think he's got some pretty interesting perspective on how we deal with the things we talked about yesterday, which is you know the need to really advance the field with um, advanced instrumentation development and and how, how much of a part can virtual play in that as we realize that you know the bricks and mortar is a pretty essential part of developing um, advanced instrumentation. So thanks, Edie. Um, we thought it might be a, a way to illuminate this conversation to pick a couple of projects that I've worked on in the past that, that might have benefited or, or not benefited from a virtual institute and talk about them as, as case studies. So there's two. Like Edie said, I was a defense, I worked in a defense contract for a defense contractor for quite a while. We did some, some pretty wild projects, very similar to what we all do now, put equipment in the ocean. Uh, just the customer was slightly different and the process was wildly different. So the project I'm, I'm thinking of uh, was had many of the elements of a virtual project and even some of the elements of a virtual institute. Management was in one place. The analysis we need to do uh, to do the design were in another place. There were subsystems built ar around the country. Integration and test uh, happened in an another location, and then we deployed the system all over the world. It was really a, a pretty challenging and, and very fun project, and, and had some of these elements. So, so the interesting thing, if I if I use two metrics to to evaluate how that project might have happened in a more virtual institute, 
or even a more virtual environment. If I pick um, the ability to foster innovation as one metric and efficiency as a second metric, it, it's kind of an interesting um, thought process. So, so this defense project, which was a system concept level kind of project, not operational. Uh, as far as innovation, there was plenty of innovation, absolutely. But it, it all happened at the subsystem level. So if you were building a subsystem, pretty much you were at a bricks and mortar facility somewhere with your group of generally engineers, uh, and you could innovate to your heart's content. And there was nothing in that process that really prevented us from, and there was lots of cool stuff going on. What didn't happen uh, is innovation across subsystems. So, uh, so that, that's kind of sort of one of the most important differences that I'll talk about uh, with respect to the next project also. So plenty of innovation within your small group, within your small bricks and mortar institution. Doing it across bricks and mortar institutions was hard. Uh, primarily because you're working on hardware and, and you know, you'll kind of all have to be looking at the same set of hardware uh, to be making progress. So the other metric that I talked about was efficiency. And efficiency is relative. <laughs> if you're working on a defense department um, contract, the budgets are different than they are in the academic world. I'm sure I don't have to tell anyone here uh, that. Um, but was it efficient? It was efficient in, in some ways, right? We could develop technology very quickly because there was a mature process at each of these uh, bricks and mortar institutions. We pretty much knew what we were doing, even though this was wildly different than many of the things we've done in the past. We had a base to build on and all the assets, both both bricks and mortar, shops, labs, all those things, and, and more importantly, the people and expertise we needed were all there in one place. What was inefficient was the volume of paper. This was actually before email, I hate to say. Um, the amount of paper that was required to make this process efficient. Tons of documents, so very detailed system requirements documents, lots of meetings to develop those requirements. Every step of the way, there's some document that um, that defines what you've done, what you're going to do, and lots of interface control documents, and it was pretty soul-crushing, actually, to work on all those um, paper products. Uh, even if you could do them now um, um, electronically, it still takes a lot of effort and, and reduces the efficiency. So, so there's one project, lots of innovation at the subsystem level, pretty virtual project to start with, uh, hard to innovate uh, across disciplines. I'll use disciplines instead of subsystems. Efficient, again, in the single brick and mortar institution, not so efficient because of all the work that had to be done to coordinate those um, bricks and mortar institutions. So now I have the other project, uh, which uh, Ed DeLong uh, talked about yesterday, the ESP. Um, far and away the most rewarding project I've ever worked on, defense or not, great system. If you don't know about the ESP, you should I Google it. I think we've it. got a picture of it, don't we? <laughs> oh yeah, next slide. Totally, uh, totally a cool project. Um, so the ESP, for those of you who don't know, pulls in water, uh, does a fairly sophisticated um, uh, chemical assay on, on this device and then is able to identify molecules of a specific, in this case, RNA sequence. And they're extending that device to do, um, to look at more than just um, what bugs are there based on their RNA sequence, but also uh, what, what genes are doing what stuff. Now this is beyond my, I'm the engineer, science is pretty much over my head, so I'm gonna stop there, talk to Ed, he knows <laughs> way more than I ever will about this. But it's, it's both scientifically and from an engineer's perspective, really a fun project, pretty challenging. I think it qualifies as a next generation instrument that the tech, um, the SOI, of course, is interested in technology, uh, and this serves as the kind of our model for the kind of projects they may be interested in the future. So the good news is it was all done in one place. The bad news is it's hard to evaluate how it might have worked in a virtual environment. But the, the part I wanted to emphasize is the reason this project was both so challenging and so rewarding was, for, for me personally, and I also, I think, from a management perspective, was, was the fact that I got to work sort of hand in hand with a whole different culture of people. The scientists I got to work with were really fun. They had a different way of looking at things. I benefited from learning from them. Uh, they, I hope, <laughs> I like to think that they benefited from working um, with me. I think I've had some impact because I hear Chris Sholin say, it's the requirements. What are the requirements? And the fact that I have, you know, the, the uh, senior scientist uh, director of, um, of Ambari talking about requirements really just warms the cockles of my heart. <laughs> um, in, in any event, here's the part that, that, that would, would have been hard to do in a virtual institution. So, so this was a challenging project. And the interesting thing was, in order to solve the problems we had to work on, 
it, it was not an engineer who could come up with a solution or a scientist who could come up with a solution. It was both of us, all of us, bashing our heads against this problem. And, and, and that's the part we have to guard against. I think we all agree it's not a question of bricks and mortar or virtual. It's going to be both. And it's going to be more and more virtual, particularly if we want to tackle projects that are big. Um, so my point here is that, you know, we all know it's becoming more virtual. What we have to do is make sure that those face-to-face -face detailed interactions among people, I find it hard for me as an engineer to talk about these <laughs> personal sociological interactions, but it is true, those were the things that progressed this project in particular. So there is a need for these sort of bricks and mortar institutions to exist to allow that kind of development to go on. And uh, efficiency, it was efficient in the sense that everyone in the group, the stakeholders, the reviewers, the funders, at least one step removed from the funders, the people doing the work, the engineers, the scientists, the analysts, the customers, the operators, everyone was there. If we had a question about how to design some mechanical aspect this, of this system in a way that made sure we could deploy it off the ship, well, we just had to walk out the door across the street, go talk to the ship operators, and that's an incredibly effective um, uh, capability when you're all in one location. It can certainly be done uh, via Google Groups or or, or Skype or whatever, much harder, particularly with groups that aren't as technologically savvy as some of the others. So, so um, it's you know the old water cooler effect of um, just being able to walk down the hall and talk to somebody about something. And now there's been some studies that have come out. Um, there was one at Harvard um, about the proximity effect and uh, uh, citation impact. Uh, Although there was another one that came out in Europe at about the same time that showed that that proximity effect and citation impact correlated for the biological sciences, but didn't for the physical sciences, which was, was kind of interesting. Um, anyway, from the science perspective, um, Peter, we, you want to discuss um, some of these issues? Uh, yeah, I'm going to, I guess, riff a little bit off what uh, Jean was saying here. So. Uh, so I'm a scientist with engineering tendencies, like many of you in this room, a sci engineer or however uh, Jules uh, phrased it. Um, and, you know, I think, it's, I think it's fair to say that scientists have been working virtually for a long time, and it's, this is not new. Uh, the means by which we worked virtually have changed tremendously, right? And so I'm of the generation that grew up with computers, but with out an internet. The first time uh, I launched Netscape Navigator was in graduate school. It was like my second or third year. And I thought, oh my God, what is this thing? And I think, uh, you know, uh, watching, you know, sort of being of that generation, able to see how science, you know, sort of moved from being very, um, these sort of uh, scientific collaborations, being very, these sort of virtual versions involving a lot of paper and some face-to-face -face meetings at some interval, to now being quite virtual, right? And, and, uh, uh, it's 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 the, the the mechanisms in a sense the modes by which we communicate that have changed the most right and so in thinking about my collaborations um, w most of my colleagues are at other institutions right which I think is 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 true for many of us right and, and so you know Julie Huber is an example or Brian Glazer you know we communicate we sit there we get on Google Groups or or, or the like and we we hang out and talk about our science and what we need to do. All right, so in thinking about virtual institutions, it seems like, well, maybe that's just a, an amplification of what this small group of three of us do, right? Maybe it's just like what we three do, except maybe 30 people or 100 people. But I, I'm not necessarily sure that's the case, and I wanted to share a couple of examples for us to think about. So uh, I had the, the fortune of being involved in a number of telepresence cruises this summer, right? And there was one in particular in which Tim Shank was, was the, the, the chief out there and did a great job of kind of coordinating this telepresence activity. And so I'm sitting there in my office and listening to Tim, and we're all typing and identifying you know, critters. There's, what, Tim, 50 of us? online and, and we're participating in this virtual cruise, it was mind-blowing. One of the things that became very apparent to me in participating in that is they're really, we, that's functioned best when there was good management. And I think that I wanted to underscore this idea of good management. I think in a virtual institution you really need someone to, to sort of manage the interactions so that they're constructive and that they, they uh, benefit sort of, uh, two things. One, that they're sort of constructive and continue to move you know, sort of forward in the most efficient way possible. Uh, but two, that they kind of, management can spark and sort of foster innovation and collaboration by connecting, 
you know, people in this virtual network. Um, there's a term for this uh, uh, knowledge broker, in a sense, where uh, people are specifically uh, sort of deliberately trying to connect people and uh, with different skills and different uh, uh, um, resources to solve a particular problem. And I think in the context of virtual institutions, that is paramount, right? And something that I'm excited to see happening. On the other hand, there really is value to face, you know, to face-to-face -to -face interactions. I mean, otherwise, I don't think Schmidt would have flown us all out here, right? If we could have done this online. So, how do we kind of best capitalize off of that? Well, as a scientist, I can tell you that when I was a postdoc at Ambari, one of my favorite things to do was, you know, walk down the hall and 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 talk with the engineers. And um, uh, Ed, who was my advisor, uh, uh, graciously, you know, had, had you know, offered some latitude in this and said, you know, you go, you go work on on this and and talk mass specs and the like. And if I weren't in that environment, I don't know that I could have done that as well uh, as as you know. As it, as it turned out, right? And um, so there was really great value in being able to walk down, chat with Gene or chat with Jim uh, or, or other engineers uh, there. So I bring that up because I think uh, there's, there's actually even greater value in having these, we'll call them physical nodes in a virtual network. Um, maybe we should think of them as design studios. So in the context of Schmidt, maybe physical locations where uh, there is perhaps a knowledge broker there who can act uh, to uh, foster collaborations, uh, improve efficiency of interactions, uh, things of the sort would, would be of value in, this, in these virtual networks as we think about them. So I'll, I'll leave it at that in the interest of time so we can have a conversation about these points. Well, to, to take off on that point, then I, I think we want to kind of look at what institutions in the future can do to maximize the benefits of virtual institutions or organizations or whatever we're going to call them um, and minimize the the drawbacks some of which we've addressed um, Susan you talked about the real importance of good management and um, I wondered if you had any thoughts about how that can be approached um, to maximize the benefits and perhaps I could do it by the illustration of the experience I had sure um, uh, which was about eight years. It was before I came to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, so it's in my prior life um, as an atmospheric scientist. Um, and uh, I, was, uh, I, I really had a wonderful experience with um, the, the development and operations of a virtual workshop. Um, it was uh, stimulated by a surprise discovery in a satellite mission of an emergent property of a sun-atmosphere connection that had never been observed before. It was not understood. And that became sort of a locus of a, a group of face-to-face -face meetings that said, whoa, what's going on here? Um, how come we haven't seen this before in other uh, space missions? Um, at the same time, I was uh, co-chairing or chairing a, um, uh, the equivalent of SCORE. It's called, in the atmosphere, it's called SCOSTEP. It's an it's a international coordinating group. Um, and they, we decided to put together a virtual workshop on this particular topic. So, um, you know, the steering committee got together. They started um, basically probing the problem a little bit. Um, and those institutions, the bricks and mortar institutions, obviously allowed these people to work together. Um, that led to uh, an understanding of what kind of data sets needed to be pulled together in a virtual observatory. The internet hub um, that I talked about in my diagram was a bricks and mortar organization. It was um, Johns Hopkins um, APL, Applied Physics Lab. Um, they basically developed, had the software, they had the databases, they created the virtual observatory, they did the software for the, the workshop. Um, the, there was a team that worked virtually to, just like you would organize a regular conference, uh, it took a year in the planning, where you had um, basically uh, uh, program chairs, um, you had uh, coordinators, um, you had people contributing ideas, you had people contributing posters. Um, the, the conference ran for a month um, with a two-week intensive period. Um, 20 countries participated in this uh, workshop over 300 scientists. And what the value was, was the ability to not only have the scientists participate, but those who were involved in the instrument design, the instrument development, the, inter the data analysis, and having them interacting with the scientists in real t in time, 
basically provided a depth of perspective of what you could be uh, seeing. And, it was, and you don't usually get that when you go to a face-to-face -face conference or a workshop because you don't have the ability to bring that uh, everyone um, in the same room. So it was the creation of a, there's a living archive. Um, they, the outcomes were um, scientifically rewarding. Um, there was a uh, recommendations for what the follow-up virtual workshop would be. Unfortunately, when we approached NSF, they did not have the regional coordinate networks or SAVI, um, so it was not done. But it was a, an experience that showed how, and, and really what I think bricks and mortar institutions need to do is certainly encourage um, their scientists to participate in these activities. Um, certainly, I think all of us should be encouraging our scientists to think of shared data resources, the ability to have the right metadata that which, when you prepare yourselves in a brick and mortar organization, being able to make sure that that data is um, shared. Um, and um, we've been very fortunate, uh, I think, at Woods Hole to get funding from um, the Moore Foundation to really do some four or five projects that uh, on bioimaging that have been really, really, really great. And the Bico Demo uh, Data Center is also another one. So we have these in our community. Um, it's a matter of taking advantage of them and finding the host institution that will be that internet hub. And that host institution could be a university, it could be a professional society, it could be a commercial entity, it could be uh, uh, you know any, a federal agency for whatever. So. So the thing I found interesting about that story was, first of all, that this was done pro bono by all of the groups involved. Um, and I guess it was APL that took the, um, the management lead on it. it did. Yeah. Um, and then that it didn't get funded on, given the great success that it initially showed, but I think it was ahead of its time. I think it, I think it was, but it was a glimpse into a future um, that was, was quite exciting, exciting scientifically. And, um, and so, David, maybe you could um, address how things at NSF are going, I mean, you did it to a certain extent, but that this is more likely to be encouraged in the future. Uh, yes, I think uh, that at NSF, we're always concerned about maximizing, maximizing the value of the investments that we make. Uh, and about 50% of the budget of, the, of my division uh, is invested in facilities. Uh, those facilities are at a rel uh, most of them are at a relatively small number of large institutions that are on the donut that people were uh, talking about yesterday. Uh, for, so for our, but there is a great human capacity in this nation and in other, and, and in other countries in, in all the um, researchers that are at the smaller institutions, community colleges, small colleges, universities in the center of the nation in which there may only be one or two oceanographers. And, and in many of the Midwestern universities, there, there is a, a, maybe a couple of people that do ocean science. And for those people at those kinds of institutions, being able to be part of a collaboration like this, uh, where they're full-fledged members of an of a intellectual group of scientists all focused on a, on a problem, probably using facilities, probably using uh, some of the databases that um, we hope people continue to use after they've been collected. So we see um, great value in maximizing the nation's capacity to make use of all the, the human knowledge uh, and, and, and diversity of that knowledge, the geographic diversity and the institutional diversity to bring people together. Uh, and I think that, that kind of diversity adds greatly to the value of, uh, of a collaboration when you pull those people together. Um, I thought it was very interesting in that European study, this, this fact that it, the biological sciences showed this proximity effect for citation impact, um, whereas the physical sciences didn't. And so I'd be interested in, um, Oscar, your opinions about uh, how much that has to do with the culture of the sciences versus the um, uh, actual nature of how the science gets done. I mean, we have, we have some culture issues specifically in the oceanographic community too, and the, the idea of um, open sourcing um, is not something that's generally embraced, so that might be discussed as well. Yeah, it's really transitioned. I mean, there's, uh, if you look at the younger generation, they're very comfortable sharing data. Um, we started sharing data very early on, and I was specifically told by my director that I was making a bad career decision and I should really not go down that road. Um, I'm happy to say that's changing, but the problem is, is you at that time didn't get credit for data. So there were several publications that were published 
where people had taken data, wrote a sole author paper of data that we had collected, and uh, there was nothing you could put in your tenure packet. So first you got really pissed. Um, but then after that you realized it was a victory because it's a glimpse of where we're gonna go. Um, if you look at the genomic community, they are very comfortable with having huge multi-author papers. The same in some of the f real hardcore physical sciences. I think we are transitioning to that and sort of the advice you'd give a young scientist, you better have your sole author paper. I think that's gonna, we're in the sunset phase of that and I think that's a good thing. Um, but valuing the data that then will be mined by a community for 20 years has to be elevated. Um, and I think we're in that process right now. Peter, did you want to add anything to that from your experience? Yeah, I think that the uh, movement towards not just sort of open source and software, but open design and hardware development is one that capitalizes off of the enthusiasm of the broader public. Uh, and I also think it's, um, uh, it, it really sparks innovation because oftentimes w we get caught in our rut in terms of how we think about solving problems. But um, noticing a little timer here, I think I imagine the audience here has uh, lots to say on this as well. Yes, I, I think uh, Jean had one small comment. Just one quick comment, it just sort of stimulated this thought in my mind that one of the things that sort of always irks me about what we do, in, what I do in, in any engineering project is a lot of the same stuff. And then I look at my colleagues doing projects and they're doing very similar stuff. And, and there is another advantage here in that these, uh, the uh, e-commons that, uh, that uh, Susan mentioned, a lot of the work we can do, we can put in the e-commons, we can put pressure housings, we can put processor boards, we can put uh, algorithms for um, control, control systems and all these things so that people who maybe don't have that expertise in their facility, regardless of whether it's virtual or bricks and mortar, can simply look it up, grab some working piece of code or some set of designs for a, um, pressure housing or a hydraulic manifold or you know a chemical uh, system and then just suck it right into their system and so that, that also would be a you know a massive advantage for to, to to improve our efficiency so un unfortunately i don't think we have time for the interpretive dance but um, i think we do have time for questions so that, that's really not unfortunate <laughs> <laughs> So, um, Marsha McNutt, I have a, a question. A few of you, well, I, I believe this is one example in uh, going to these virtual institutes where we could be running the risk where the technology in order to uh, build these virtual institutes could possibly be getting out ahead of the ethnology or the sociology of being able to take best advantage of it. And there are numerous examples throughout the history of science where technology gets out ahead of the social systems. Um, for example, uh, David Conover uh, gave um, the example of how we want to break down the institutional walls to be more inclusive. But the uh, good thing about institutions is there's a basic trust that grows up within those institutions. And the reason why we often collaborate outside of our institutions is that we have colleagues we trust outside of our institutions. So are we um, abandoning one kind of trust system for another kind of trust system through those virtual collaborations? And how do we actually build new kind of collaborations that are truly open and engage the very best collaborators that we can find and actually be as inclusive as possible with the best talent we can find for these virtual institutions and how do we um, make them as uh, open and not just the old boys club or the old girls club. And so do you have ideas as to how we can truly make these virtual institutes open and not just uh, closed. Is it, you know, the, the idea that, that Peter um, put forward about having some nodes that bring people in and engage new people through postdocs and um, students or is it uh, through some other mechanism? I'd love to hear how we can really bring the sociology of this up 
to match the technology? Or is it through some partnership with institutions? What are some ideas? When you're talking about the technology, you're talking about the um, things like virtual workshop technology, that kind of technology, right, correct? Exactly. Right. Yeah, go I, ahead. I, I think the key is, is you have to have a core interest that drives that community come together. When you go onto the web and you join some social community, you join it because you're interested in the bird watching community or the weather community. And so if, if we would have a bricks and mortar institution that provided a management frame for this cyber tools, you would also have to have a process by which when there are really key areas that are gonna galvanize a group to hold a virtual observatory or whatever, that there would be a review process. Yeah. The, 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 the trust is um, ultimately, it's gonna self-select. You're gonna start off with a big group of people. You're gonna realize 20% of them suck and are not to be trusted and it will self-winnow and it's actually a, the way we tend to form big community projects, right? You get everyone together in a room like a meeting like this to do jagoffs, and then you realize, you know, those four guys, you don't want them on it, you know? And so I think there, there, there is a fear, but you know, if you have lots of communication going on, um, you're going to establish the trust through that communication. It takes discipline though. We can't multi, when you're in one of these virtual places, you can't be also, on your internet, on your phone, this or that, you have to have the discipline to be committed so that you can actually determine who you trust and who you don't trust. You know, part of this is a, is a matter of, uh, of peer pressure, actually. Once you form a collaboration, if you, and whether this is virtual or only at your home institution, uh, first of all, every person that's part of this collaboration has to be contributing something, not just parasitizing. Um, and uh, as that group evolves, um, the, these, these uh, matters of trust evolve along with them. Uh, and those members of a group who uh, take a piece of data off on their own, publish a paper without, without properly attributing to the whole group, uh, will quickly find themselves probably uh, being isolated from the central collaboration itself. And I do think that there are, um, that you're absolutely right that the social dimensions of making these collaborations successful is something that still needs a lot of evolution. Uh, and you can think about, um, we had some discussion about um, uh, how, about the, the nature of interacting with somebody you've never actually physically met, but you only know them through the collaboration. But look what Facebook has done for people who have incredible social interactions with people they've never met. Yeah. There's another posture, internet dating, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not going to go there, uh, but uh, maybe well, one of my other it, panelists it, would like to go there. Biological oceanographer yeah, looking yeah, yeah, for yeah. an engineer. You know. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. I get those all the time. But it's really what, embarrassing. <laughs> but part of what you need in these international collaborations is the electronic water cooler. Yeah. How do you get people together just to have yeah. chatting? Uh, and I think there's probably a way to establish an electronic water cooler where people go maybe at coffee break 10 a.m. Mm. every day and chat with each other. So in spite of my um, engineering background, I kind of find these conversations about people and relations and trust, for example, really interesting. Don't, don't tell my engineering colleagues. Um, and I, I have another case study. It was uh, on one of the projects I mentioned, not the ESP project. And, and the relationship was the analysis, the analyst doing this really sort of very, you know, heavily uh, analytical stuff that we then had to implement uh, in hardware at our little institution or bricks and mortar institution. Um, and, and we, it, there was no technology involved. It was classified projects, so information got passed in a very ponderous way. And I was working specifically with one fellow who I never met, didn't know from Adam. He was an analyst, which was already, you know, suspicious in my engineer's book. And, and I had to implement these, these things that he, you know, these algorithms that he would come up with. And, and, and it worked even without any real technology. It worked because we had a feedback mechanism. I guess I'm thinking this out on the fly. The feedback mechanism was he'd come up with an algorithm, I'd implement it, run it against a set of tests that a different uh, group would um, come up with, the, the operators actually. And, uh, and if it worked, that was the feedback mechanism. So trust got, and those feedback loops happen regularly in engineering, much more difficult in a science community. So. All you need is feedback, <laughs> and I don't know how you do it in a science setting. It's much more difficult, but in an engineering technology setting, trust comes really quickly because he gives me stuff, 
I can build it, we can prove it works, everyone's happy. And when we finally did meet, it was like, here's the interesting sociological part, it was like we'd been friends for years. And we need that equivalent. Yeah, I, 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 well, my, that was my point, kind of gently as I could make it. <laughs> you had a comment, Susan? Yeah, I, I think that you know, you know, we're all social beings, um, and science is a social, and engineering is a social endeavor. Um, and just as in bricks and mortar organizations, the, the social interactions are governed certainly by a set of rules of engagement. Um, and in a virtual organization, you definitely have those sort of same sort of baseline rules of engagement that helps you build that trust. You're not going to steal the data. You're not going to have, you know, take a, you know, usurp someone else on a publication. You're going to give um, attribution. You're going to give co-authorship. But you're also got responsibilities. Um, and those responsibilities in a virtual organization may be very different than the responsibilities you have in your bricks and mortar um, um, institution. But if, if, if I, in, the, in a virtual group, um, if we're expecting somebody to deliver something in order to solve this problem, and that person doesn't deliver, you know, the trust erodes. Uh, and, that, and that's just sort of what you normally would have um, in, around the water cooler, around the halls of a, a bricks and mortar institution as well. Did we have another question? Yes. Go ahead. Can I go? Uh, Dawn Wright from uh, ESRI in Oregon State. My question is about power, uh, in terms of power between individuals and how a virtual organization might facilitate power to those who are powerless. And the example I'd like to use is what uh, Oscar uh, cited in terms of the younger generation of scientists who are more willing to be open uh, with their code, with their data, and yet they don't have uh, the power to uh, move forward or to be promoted and tenured because that's not part of the institutional practice. There's an institutional barrier there. But at the same time, uh, there are movements afoot such as there is a small roundtable of journal editors, I believe led by Kirsten Leonard at Lamont, which is now uh, considering the requirement that scientists publish their data and publish their code along with their papers. And so that's going to be, at some point, uh, hardwired into, into that process. But you've got the more powerful senior scientists who are editors or on those editorial boards and then you've got the less powerful students, postdocs, early career scientists. And so I'm wondering how a virtual organization might help to, might help with those power relations. I'm not sure if you can answer that, but maybe that's a topic for a virtual workshop at some point. <laughs> well, I think we talked about reward systems being yeah, I think, critical. I, I think making sure the reward system evolves is the key, you know? And I think the um, other issue is, is if you were to put together a working group that's going to turn on a virtual observatory, it, one of the criteria might be about having sort of a cross section as a man, you know, I, I, I don't picture like you have a single PI leading one of these virtual organizations. You might have a group and making sure you have a diversity of ages as well as skill sets might be part of the criteria if you're ready to get access to it. Next question, who's got the yes. microphone? Yes. Uh, John Grabiel with uh, Marine Explore and also the Marine Metadata Interoperability Project. Uh, my question is about trust, not of the individuals in the virtual organization, but about the virtual organization itself. And I think I might put you a little on the spot here, uh, David, if that's okay. A, a, a virtual organization that is very much discussed in the uh, community is EarthCube. And uh, you didn't really mention it, but maybe you could talk about its re uh, uh, relevance in this discussion, and particularly with respect to the biggest issue that I uh, hear expressed, especially from scientists, which is the weight given to the long-range, pie-in-the-sky cyber infrastructure virtual organization versus the weight given to the actual scientific observations that it's supposedly built for. Yeah, so it does, it does touch on both of those issues. Um, the, uh, the pie in the sky in, uh, view, uh, what we're really trying to achieve is to build a whole new uh, cyber infrastructure that is so general that it encompasses most of the kinds of data sets uh, that are involved throughout all the geosciences and the analytical tools as well. Uh, and it, it'll be searchable, uh, it'll, be, um, it'll enable, actually be fundamentally um, uh, instrumental to virtual, these sorts of virtual organizations, and it makes the, those virtual organizations uh, function much more um, 
e easily. Uh, yeah, there's two pieces to it. There is building this new um, uh, architecture, but there's also uh, the whole issue of open, open data access, which is evolving right out from under us and making the uh, data depositories more accessible, more discoverable, more searchable. Uh, and that's an important piece of it too. Uh, but what we're really doing is in engaging the community and bringing together the uh, scientists, the uh, cyber infrastructure uh, specialists, um, the engineers, uh, to think about how to create this format. So that's really what we're aiming at. And uh, it, you know, it is a, it's an evolving process itself, uh, which many of the participants find very exciting to be part of because we, we are not throw, we're not saying, here's what we're looking for. We're asking the community to actually help us make this evolve in a manner that will serve the purposes of many people. So if you're not involved in EarthCube, I hope you will get involved in it. Um, uh, ocean sciences is one piece of it. It's a very important piece of it. Uh, I think it'll be uh, 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 it'll be the kind of thing that actually can make these uh, these uh, virtual institutes um, even more effective than they are now. Yeah, in a sense, this harkens back to uh, my comment what I was trying to get across when I mentioned management. I think that as we build virtual institutions, that the, that a, a, a set of people uh, should be involved in. Um, establishing sort of rules of engagement, or at least providing some sense of definition, this sort of virtual Wild West thing is problematic. Now, on, on, on the specific context of EarthCube, you know, I'll, I'll say up front, I had no idea what EarthCube was for a long time <laughs> until I attended an EarthCube meeting. And I, I will say that the onus is on the community to tell NSF what the best sort of value would be of this virtual institution. So, and, and it's, it, it's really then to the NSF to respond to, 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 that, to that input, right? And so in a sense, that's, that's um, distributed management. Hello, uh, Verena Tanakliff from University of Victoria. I, I wanted to ask if we could just for a moment move away from a rather North American-centric discussion. In a few months, Falcor is leaving Hawaii and headed for the Western Pacific and uh, engaging with other nations, uh, many nations that uh, are not necessarily um, conversant with the kinds of technologies we use and the kinds of interactions and institutions you've been discussing. Can you think a little bit about, oh, and perhaps suggest a couple of mechanisms through virtual engagement that will build those interactions with uh, people who are less powered, as Don mentioned, and build trust, as Marsha mentioned. Is there something more specific that one could put out there, given this wonderful opportunity through Falco? Can, I, can we pick on someone in the audience for an idea? Sure. Chuck? <laughs> I, I, I point to Chuck because I know Chuck's been engaged with SOPAC and has interacted a lot with, uh, uh, with uh, um, sort of ministers in the different uh, countries in the South Pacific. Yeah, so I don't really know where to start as an answer to that question. I think that um, we don't want to underestimate the uh, technology in the Western Pacific countries and there, there are certainly access to... Um, to internet and, inter and interactive technologies is way up in the last few years, but. Uh, well, Chuck, I would think that, um, uh, you know, one of the first steps to building that trust would be the, ver you know, allowing them to go on a virtual dive. I mean, that's something you've done, you've, you've participated in, and I think that, that that outreach is the first step to making the contact and building the trust and, and making them aware of what the capabilities are, don't you? So in that part of the world, in my experience, the first step in building the trust is, is not virtual. Um, it's still very much face-to-face -face and spending time with the people and getting to know the individuals. Um, You're talking about drinking in third world bars? Um, no, <laughs> but yeah, that helps, that helps. But no, really, it's going, it's, it's interacting with agencies like the SPC and SOPAC and um, the various ministries there. And certainly in involving, involving people, bodies, in what you're doing as well. I mean, I think that on the one hand, we can use these kind of technologies to reach out to schools and to ministries, but as far as building trust, 
my experience in the Western Pacific, is that's done one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, with people that you can um, you can contact and interact with directly. <clears throat> I might add something to that about the North. It is we have been sort of North American centric, and we've been talking about research virtual institutions. But um, my own background is in fishery science. I don't know if Daniel Polly is still here. But um, he's done a lot of, there he is over there, a lot of work to bring tools available to nations which don't have the technical expertise uh, that the other nations do. And um, it's absolutely true that we can do a lot and maybe virtual institutes can be a mechanism by which we can make connections to, uh, across nations that are more interested in conservation and management questions that involve the ocean as well as research. Uh, so there are those dimensions, I think, that can be very valuable in terms of information sharing uh, and, uh, and management and stewardship issues that relate to the ocean. Who has the microphone? Me. Hello. <laughs> Other side. Michael Klages, Gothenburg University, Sweden. I have a question which links to what Oscar has, has addressed in this, in this uh, panel session today. The question about how to give credit to published data. And um, I have been involved in, in various EU-funded projects in, in, the EU, in, in Germany and Sweden. And in these um, EU-funded projects, the, the work package data management and utilization plan is always a big issue. And what we have learned all the time is that the, the bottleneck in data streaming from, from these projects into public databases is really the single scientist. They are always sitting on their data sets because they, they, they treat them as their private property. The, the solution we have in mind, and this is a question perhaps to David, um, why not giving published data sets also more credit in terms of digital object identifiers? digital object identifiers. That is a common use nowadays. If funding agencies would give credit to applicants having a long list of digital object identifier citations, then uh, we would certainly generate a stream of data into public databases. And that's my question to David. Is this something you can imagine or could imagine that NSF and other funding agencies uh, would implement a proce procedure that digital object identifiers for databases, published data, is also a, a kind of credit for funding. Absolutely. In fact, we, uh, uh, about a year or two ago, two ago, released a Dear Colleague letter in the geosciences, uh, specifically on data citation. Um, it's, you're, you're absolutely right that we need to move towards uh, a, a reward system and a recognition system that puts the same weight on data citation as it does on literature citation. So that at the end of a, when you publish a paper, there's a literature cited section, there should be another section that says data cited with the, with the director, with the locations where you can go to find that data. And if you can imagine, a lot of us use t techniques like, uh, tools like the web of science or web of knowledge to find literature. Well, what we need is a web of data. Uh, where all you can search it, you can find the locations of, of where data is located just as now as, as where you can find uh, publications. Uh, uh, but I also think that a big piece of this, uh, NSF can only do so much to, um, to encourage this kind of change, but it's absolutely true that the academic institutions that employ people and, and that uh, judge their uh, criteria for promotion and tenure have to put the same value into um, data citation as they do to uh, literature citation. Because now, as presently, as you all know, it's almost all weighted towards publications and not data. But there are journals starting up every day that allow publication of primary data sets. Yes. Yeah, and we'll be in a, it, I think, uh, moving towards a system in which when you see a published paper and it's electronic, you can click on a graph and it takes you to the data. But I, I yeah, yeah. I'm involved with Elsevier. They're, they're allowing the dot big data to be interactive so people yeah. can actually click on it. But I'm also working towards getting them to allow people to publish their data and also their algorithms, as Dawn has said, so that we create a competitive atmosphere for people uh, where the data sets are there and people say, well, I 
can do a better job than you with my data set. We're trying to do this. It is, in fact, very interesting how our discussions about virtual institutions are starting to gradually transition into the discussion of the data sharing and publication. <laughs> and that will be the topic of our next panel. We now have probably <laughs> enough time for just for one last <laughs> question from Dave McKinney at NOAA. Dave, please go ahead. And this will complete our panel discussion. We'll have a half hour break. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Victor. And I'd suggest that we cancel break because we need a lot more time to talk about this. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, so I, I was going to ask about open data, uh, which is a topic that's pretty important to us in NOAA. Um, we have a couple of examples represented in the room. We got um, how we operate the Okeanos Explorer uh, with free and open access to the data. You can get the archive in about uh, six weeks normally off the ship um, if uh, you want to wait for the, the um, the full bathymetric data set, for example. And then we have the example of the uh, Global Tropical Mord Buoy Array, uh, operated by Chris Sabine's group at, uh, at PML, where it was in the mid-90s, I think, they decided to make the data available uh, in real time to whoever wanted it and worked out some of the incentive issues. Um, so it's, it's very encouraging to hear Oscar talk about how that's, that's actually changing by culture and by the nature of the, of the folks involved. Um, we also heard yesterday uh, a proposal that uh, perhaps at NSF, perhaps through some other mechanism, that data providers um, be funded separately and have a completely different set of incentives, um, with citations or, or other metrics for how the data are used. Um, and so I wanted to ask um, a, a couple of questions. First of all, what's the, um, you've been talking about it, but, but is there a specific reaction to the idea of having separate funding streams and therefore separate incentives for data collectors um, and data analyzers? Um, and um, that's one question. And the other question is, uh, uh, David, you've been very um, thought-provoking about some of the things that NSF is, is doing, but what can the other federal agencies do to help kind of accelerate um, this trend towards open data? We've got our, our legal requirements now, um, but there's perhaps more we can do programmatically. Thank you. You want to, you want to feel that well, one? I, well, um Far be it for me to tell other federal agencies what they should be doing with their data. Um, uh, and, and those, a lot of the other, you know, NSF is unique because uh, we're not a regulatory agency. Uh, uh, and so we don't have some of the same issues, uh, for instance, that, that are illustrated by the Deepwater Horizon situation where there is a lot of data collection being going on by multiple agencies, but, but some of it um, ends up uh, in, in the getting involved in, with the legal process. So uh, there are cases in which uh, uh, there are probably more constraints on some of the other federal agencies. But, but as you know, uh, the uh, director of OMB issued a memo, uh, it's about a year now, directing all the federal agencies to come up with uh, open access data plans for their agencies, and those were all submitted, I think it was uh, by the 1st of September of this year. And uh, uh, so, so uh, the, the, uh, at least the present, uh, the, the current presidential administration wants to see all the agencies move to uh, open data, open access uh, uh, process. Uh, so um, uh, I haven't um, read what those plans are from the other agencies. I believe since those, and I'm not sure if they're public yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it, there, that process is underway. My one thought is, is right now the biggest impediment from the academic side are the academics. Because you cannot write a proposal to NSF to just analyze and create knowledge with existing data. It, you're only really paid to go collect data. And that's not, I would argue, a fault of the agency. It's just you will be savaged by your own colleagues. And that's where I think our cultural maturity has to accelerate. And I would say that uh, the facilities we support are our data providers in many ways. Uh, our, our, the drilling vessel program is a data provider. Uh, OOI, once it's up and operating, will be a data provider. Uh, our research vessels, you know, we have the rolling deck to repository program, which streams data, makes it available very quickly. Um, that's also a data provider. So all of our facilities really are where we're making the investments in data providers. Uh, and, and then, of course, there's the science uh, grants as well which um, also, but one of the things that's uh, crucial to remember about NSF, we, we have data management policies and requirements, um, but really depend on the individual PIs to follow through with the plans they submit when they submit a proposal and say they're going to post their data in a certain place because we don't, uh, we have a very, we have a very lean staff and we don't have the capacity to, uh, 
double check uh, that everything that PI said they were going to do when it comes to putting, making their data available actually takes place. Um, I think what you're going to see is in, in, we're going to have increasing requirements that as part of your next proposal in the five-page section where you tell us what you did with the previous work, that you tell us where, how the, that work is now posted on the web, and when that gets peer-reviewed or, or made available in some fashion, when that gets peer-reviewed, um, probably if, that's, uh, if there are statements in there that aren't fully fact accurate that your, your peers, again, it'll be a peer pressure situation, your, your peers will let us know that, uh, you know, in that last award, uh, they've done tremendous work, but they still haven't made that data available to anybody else. Uh, so I think you're going to see that become part of the peer review process. That's my prediction anyway. Okay. Thank you so much, Edie, and Thank the you. panel participants. This was indeed a very interesting discussion. And uh, we would like to Welcome everybody back in half an hour. Please enjoy coffee and we will be talking about